program tonight is called We Build a Movement from Books with Carol CJ, Jack Collins, and Jim Van Busker. And so Jim is a co-author with Susan Strecker of Gay by the Bay, a history of, of queer culture in the San Francisco Bay Area, and co-editor with Catherine Forrest of Love Castro Street, Reflections of San Francisco. From 1992 to 2007, he was program manager of the James C. Hormel Gay and Lesbian Center at the San Francisco Public Library. So let's please welcome Jim and the rest of the panel. We are just going to dive right in, and uh, Carol and Jack are going to introduce themselves, and then we're going to start telling <laughs> stories, and then we want to hear from you, your story. So. Um, what I want to say briefly, briefly, is that I um, rode a motorcycle to San Francisco in 1973, and by 1975 I was volunteering at a woman's place bookstore in Oakland. Who remembers woman's place? Yes. Um, where, of course, I fell in love and got involved with Paula Wallace, and it took only a few months to convince her that if Oakland had a women's bookstore. San Francisco should have one too. So I got her to open Old Wives Tales with me. So who remembers Old Wives Tales? <laughs> 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 I sat the audience. Um, so in 1976 on Halloween, we opened Old Wives Tales. Uh, about a month before that, I started publishing Feminist Bookstore Newsletter, which became Feminist Bookstore News, which was essentially the trade magazine of the women's bookstore movement, and went to every feminist bookstore eventually in the English-speaking world. We didn't recognize that border of Canada, so, of course, the Canadians, but also the English-speaking bookstore in Japan and Nigeria and Bangladesh and India as well as Europe. So that was a network of women's bookstores. And then later, after all of that, um, I started a publication called Books to Watch Out For, which was a newsletter uh, about books, lesbian books. I did the lesbian edition, and I prevailed upon Richard Labonte, yeah, a little yeah. show of hands and appreciation, uh, to do the gay men's edition. So, that's what I'm doing here, is remembering all of that. My name is uh, Jack Collins, and um, I worked, uh, I, I started teaching at City College in 1980, where I um, was brought in to teach what was then called gay literature. Um, and thanks to a number of really great colleagues, over time, we established our cohort program in gay and lesbian studies at Queens Hall, Paul, um, first in the nation, uh, 2,000 students a week. Uh, it was great. Um, I was able to do that because um, I had been a scholarship boy at uh, very elite universities. Um, and I was trained as a medievalist. Um, I uh, studied at Columbia University, Columbia College, where I got my uh, BA in 1970, Medieval Studies, which was a, a, the major I made up. So I could take art courses, history courses, language courses, because there was something sinister about the English department. Um, and there still is. <laughs> um, I then came out here and went to Stanford and got a, um, a master's and PhD in comparative literature. Um, and I also spent two years at King's College Cambridge where I wrote my dissertation which I'll have some stories about as we go along. Um, I worked in a rare bookstore downtown uh, called John Howell Books, which was across from the St. Francis Hotel, um, where we watched President Ford uh, get shot at. And I would often go down. For years, the bullet hole was still there. Um, and in that bookstore, in addition to looking at rarities and gorgeous books. And while I noticed there was a lot of lesbian and gay material <coughs> that were rare books because they weren't allowed to be published conventionally. Um, so I, I worked there as a salary employee and then as a consultant, and then I was brought in 
to give the, the two English instructors who gave literature a break after Proposition 13 there were no sabbaticals and I was brought in to teach that. Um, and we'll talk as we go through the evening about how things developed at Seward. Uh, but that's a brief uh, intro. I was originally supposed to be the moderator, but Carol has insisted that I have to put out the third part of the, the story. So I came to San Francisco in 1972, and I was working uh, at a bookstore, and um, then I went back to college, and <coughs> I was working on a project called, um, it was an exhibit sponsored by the Pacific Center for Human Growth, called Out of the Closets. And I think it started in about 1979, and it went to Cal State Hayward, and Berkeley Public, and Hill College, and Sacramento Public, and it was revolutionary. And I can't, can't hard to imagine, but libraries did not have exhibits of gay and lesbian books. And they had to put a disclaimer, I remember, at Berkeley Public Library. That, you know, it, so it was, it was wild. Um, and somehow I ended up going back, going to library school and then getting a job at San Francisco Public Library and uh, running the Hormel Center and um, meeting Carol and Jack. And um, I don't even know how this whole program came together except that we sat in my backyard and told stories and we realized, oh, I think that these are great stories. Let's, let's hear some more of them. So let's do. One idea I, I had was the book that, uh, one of the early books that changed our lives. And for me, I remember I was working in a bookstore in San Jose, and the book was Homosexual Oppression and Liberation by Dennis Altman. Anybody remember that book? Um, in 1971. And I was too terrified to actually buy the book from the bookstore I was working in. So I borrowed it. I took it off the shelf and I took it home and I read it really carefully. <laughs> and then I slipped it back onto the. Um, so, yes, like that. No broken bindings. Um, but that book is no longer in my collection. But I did find this afternoon another really important book. Uh, this anthology, Out of the Closets, Voices of Gay Liberation, edited by Carla J. and Alan Young. And this was sort of my Bible, and I realized, oh, there's other people like me, and they have voices, and they're writing, and there are books, and it saved my life. My, my book is, well, actually, I, I, I couldn't find a copy, but Ruby Fruit Jungle was an event. Um, and I was in New York in my old apartment with my old roommate and his then lover, Carlos. Um, and they just handed me Ruby Fruit Jungle and said, you have to read this. I said, when? And they said, right now. <laughs> and um, I was getting a flight back to England. And I, I was telling Carol before we started, I still remember the exact corner I was sitting in as I read Ruby Fruit Jungle, which was not, nothing I had ever read in my life. And it was re remarkably reassuring, I thought, a brave lesbian is like talking like a real person and telling us about her life. Yeah. So Ruby Fruit was huge for me um, in that there's nothing to be afraid of, obviously. Yeah. But it wasn't obvious then <laughs> because we were against the law just existing. Mm -hmm. um, and then a, a, another writer uh, I admired was Christopher Isherwood. Uh, who ended up, uh, he's uh, an Englishman who ended up in Hollywood writing uh, screenplays and lived uh, in Santa Monica. And in the, in the mid 70s, he came out with an incredible book called Christopher and His Kind, where he said, you know what? The reason like, I'm the way I am is because I really like members of my own sex. I really like boys. And it was the first writer who saw us kind of as a tribe, uh, or several tribes. And my little story connected with it, uh, I went to the Modern Language Association convention in 74 in New York, um, and that's the big English and foreign languages, you know, teaching and job convention and everything. 
and Isher Lord was speaking. Um, and I stood outside the audit auditorium until exactly the time that he was going to start because I was afraid someone would see me. And then I opened the door, and there were 2,000 people inside. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, nothing to be afraid of. And it's, uh, and nowadays we're afraid of a lot of things, but in those days, if you were lesbian or gay, you were afraid. Um, and so part of why we were so interested in books is that you could read a book by yourself and not have to talk, although you might have, have to sneak it out <laughs> of the bookstore. So uh, those are my little stories in that regard. The book for me was um, We Too Must Love by Anne Aldrich. I found that in uh, 1965 when I was 15. And, um, I hung out, of course, with Girl Scouts, and there were four of us one day who were going to an older Scout's house to pick something up. She wasn't there. And I know we were 15 because Tina had just gotten her driver's license, and she was the first, so she drove us over. And Debbie was gone, so we got to hang out in her room, her sister let us in. So there we were, being cool, sitting on the studio bed. And, you know, 15 year olds trying to be grown ups. And, and I saw on the shelf, spying out this title, We Too Must Love. And I had to have that book. How I knew, I, but I had to have that book. So I arranged to be the last one out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't there. <laughs> so we get in the car. Tina's new driver, lots of tension, but the tension in that car, it was, you could have chopped bricks and thrown it and smashed things with it. Um, and finally, Linda Law said, all right, go to <laughs> <laughs> It's a long silence, and finally, Tina admitted that she had it. <laughs> So being good Girl Scouts and good organizers, we arranged to circulate that book among the four of us so that we could each read it. We lived as far as 20 miles apart. We went to three different high schools, and each of us got it read within two weeks and got it back on the shelf. <laughs> and Debbie never knew. <laughs> so, that gave me some clue about books. Um, <laughs> oh, well, I knew about Girl Scouts. <laughs> um, um, the upshot was Tina thought it was disgusting. Linda went off and joined the women's soft, slow pitch softball club. <laughs> and Mary Kay and I went off into the bushes, what can I say? <laughs> but she was smart enough to write down the titles of all the books that were referred to in here and had the courage to go to the newsstand across the street from the Her Catholic Girls School and order The Well of Loneliness. And the first book in this series, We Walk Alone. And now that was run by you know, the boys, they were all college boys who worked there, because of course women couldn't get jobs working in bookstores at that point in 65. And you know, I'm still amazed by those guys. They took us seriously, they, you know, gave us the well of loneliness, and then they said, that other book you ordered is out of print, we can't get that, but she has a new book. We two won't last. <laughs> Do you want us to order that for you? Yes. <laughs> so I learned about books, I learned about the communication, and I learned that a bookseller could put books in there. Never. Let's see, I think I figured out this was probably in 1975. I was at UC Berkeley and I was totally clueless. And I was terrified to check a book out of the library. So I would make a sandwich and have a, what I call a straight book, and then a gay book, and then another straight book on top. So they only look like, you know, maybe they wouldn't notice that 
there was a, a gay bar. And by 1977, I was I'd done my um, honors thesis on the dynamics of the coming out process. So I think those books, the, the meat of those sandwiches, really uh, inspired me. When I was at Cambridge, I was researching um, what happened to three stories from from Ovid in the classical period um, through the Middle Ages. <clears throat> and one of my chapters was on a figure called Narcissus. And uh, Freudian psychology and related um, branches elaborated an entire theory of homosexuality based on narcissism. And in my thesis, I was able to demonstrate that at least in the Middle Ages and classical period, no such thing existed. Um, while I was researching the chapter, I came across the, the British Kinsey, um, Havelock Ellis, um, and I went to the card catalog in the main library at Cambridge, which are these huge, enormous books with cards pasted in them. I mean, the books are like this big. Um, and I finally found such studies in the psychology of sex, and I noticed it was classified OBSC, and I thought I wonder what that is. So I asked a librarian, and she said, oh, it's obscene. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, where do you keep the obscene books? <laughs> and she said, they're up in the, in the rare book library in special collections. Um, so I went up there. And I said, I want to look at, I'm a research student here, and I want to uh, read volume, whatever, studies in psychology of sex. And uh, the man, I remember, who I was talking to said, well, you have to get a note from your supervisor. And I said, why do I have to do that? And he said, well, because it's obscene. <laughs> and we have to make sure it's a bona fide research project. So I called my supervisor, who was, a, or a, actually, I didn't have a phone. I went to visit my supervisor, and he said, isn't this stupid? But he wrote the note. I returned, faced a woman my own age, and I said, here, can I have it yet? And she said, we have, there's one more thing you have to do. You have to sign a statement that you won't read it for pleasure. <laughs> Which I did. <laughs> I mean, it was a. <laughs> it was astonishing to me that around in the early 1900s there were actual accounts of sexual behavior among what we would now call heterosexuals, homosexuals, whatever. I mean. Uh, Avalok Ellis was amazing. He gathered all this information, but it couldn't be distributed because it was obscene. And I was really shocked at a place like Cambridge that I had to go through that rigmarole. But I did find out that the higher up you went in the hierarchy, the more puritanical it got, mm -hmm. at least in those days. Because there was a taboo on talking about sex or sexuality or homosexuality the behavior created the taboo. The behavior continued. It was criminalized, it was medicalized, but you could not talk about it. And it's some of us can remember that, some of us who are younger can't imagine it. But that's where the taboo was. And that included censorship of books. And in this country, starting in the early 60s, there were a number of famous censorship trials that ended censorship, overt censorship, in both publishing and in the movies. And one of them took place right here in San Francisco over Allen Ginsberg's Howl, um, which a, a cop went into City Lights and said, you have to take that book out of your bookstore. It's obscene. And uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti went to court, and they won a very important victory um, that we're the beneficiaries of today. Um, so uh, it's hard. Uh, the silence was deafening. It really was. And for some of us, I, I just turned 70 in October, but books were safe places to find out information about homosexuality. 
Um, and I remember um, I went to a Catholic uh, Jesuit scholarship school that we had, we had to take Latin, and one, uh, our, one of our instructors encouraged us to read widely um, and suggested a book by a Roman historian that looked at the lives of the Caesars and their sexual habits. <laughs> and around this time, Gore Vidal published a book called Julian. Um, and I went back to the, and he offered us, the teacher offered us extra credit, you know, to read anything else connected with Latin. So I went to the local public library uh, and asked to get the book Julian. And the, the librarian, who was a next door neighbor with my parents, said, you can't read that. And I said, why not? And she said, well, because you can. What, what will I say to your mother? I said, I'll deal with my mother. But I really, I said, I'm reading things in Latin class that would curl your hair, Mrs. Hughes, so <laughs> give me the book. <laughs> and she did. And we were so repressed, I can still, I think it was page 363. <laughs> The temple eunuchs were ladling honey over the naked bodies of young men and women. And I thought, this looks great. <laughs> so what year was that in Cambridge? In Cambridge, it Where was... you had to sign that you would not take any pleasure from reading. Um, 73. Wow. And for context, a woman's place bookstore, which was arguably the first women's bookstore in the land, opened in 1970. So there's already been a movement to get books, get them out, distribute them, and tell the truth of our lives. One of the things that, about that story is the, the role of the librarian and um, as a retired librarian. So uh, I did a uh, chronology of the Library of Congress subject headings because that was the, those were the terms by which we could find the books. If, so, before 1946, the um, subject heading was sexual perversion. And that lasted until 1969, when it was finally replaced by homosexuality and lesbianism, two separate. And then, um, in 1946, uh, sodomy was being used for books about the criminal aspects of homosexuality, uh, lesbianism, became a, a subject heading in 54. Um, and then, uh, in 1969, um, sexual perversion was changed to sexual deviation. I guess that's an improvement. <laughs> um, and um, then, in 1978, started to be uh, some more nuanced uh, subject headings like church work with homosexuals, gay liberation movement, um, homosexuality <coughs> male, lesbians in literature. Um, in 1985, bisexuality was added. Um, in 1987, the term gay was exchanged for homosexuality. In 1988, homophobia became an official heading. And when I compiled this in 2005, and I would have time to look, but neither queer nor transgender were being used as subject headings. So you can see how, you know, this is the lifeline to get access to materials. The Library of Congress subject heading is way behind the curve. Which is why it was upon us to change the world and change it and get information, spread things out. Um, when I wanted to ask, just because, okay, you were doing what I read, how many people here are or have been, ever been librarians? And how many people <coughs> are or have ever been publishers? <laughs> and how many people are or have ever been lesbian or gay or otherwise <laughs> troublesome making writers? <laughs> and now the really down and dirty one from my heart, how many people are now or have ever been booksellers? Yeah. This is such an incredible audience. 
Thank you all for coming tonight and for coming out to Columbus. Um, am I supposed to go somewhere from here? <laughs> <laughs> well, one, one thing I'm appreciating looking around is um, we have here a collection of the latter, which came to Kalamazoo, Michigan, and I found at my senior Girl Scout advisor's apartment when I was there <laughs> one time. Um, and then, so I think I was 16 by then. And they arranged, well, of course we couldn't talk about homosexuality, but my, the two advisors were lovers, and when I, or anyone came over, you know, the beds were pushed apart, the single beds, and then when the company left, they pushed back together. And for about a year and a half, every time the, an issue of the ladder came up, which was every two months, they, um, came up with a reason why I had to go do something at their house. <laughs> Someone left something they needed for a meeting and I had a car, I could go pick it up for them. And the latter would be sitting front and center on the dining room table. <laughs> and we didn't talk about that the whole time, but they did that. Um, and, uh, oh, of course there's a photo of um, Phyllis and Del. And I, one of the reasons I moved to San Francisco was I knew the latter was published here and that there were enough lesbians here to publish a magazine. Um, and my, one of my honors, one of the things we did as booksellers, I mean, it, it seems like, oh, well, you just open a bookstore and people come in. It's kind of, it all happens, and it does, it all happens, but one of the, we did different kinds of activism. One of them was that we noted when books were going out of print, and then we would organize through the Feminist Bookstore newsletter, someone would put out, as I did this one, that um, lesbian women had gone out of print, and it was out of stock, OSI, out of stock indefinitely. And so I made it my business to catch up with Phyllis and Bell and say, hey, your book's out of print. <laughs> we have to do something about this. Um, and one of the things you had to do was prove demand. So we s published, you know, that it's out of print and everybody should order copies. So, you know, you get 50 booksellers around the country ordering five or 10 or 25 copies and the publisher goes, oh, well, I guess somebody wants this, and, and it's enough demand that we can make money. So then they would reprint it. We did that with book after book after book. It was one of our strategies. You know, it's enough. It's not enough to write the books and get them published, but then we had to keep them in print. So I, I ended up. <laughs> Another title that I think I had to give to myself, but. Del and Phyllis and I knew that I was a bookseller to the queens of lesbian <laughs> Okay. Um, the other the other thing I want to say about looking around is there's also a color a copy of what color is your handkerchief, which was that ominous, very scary, very exciting book about S and M. And and you know there's these reputations that women's bookstores have somehow been assigned, and I'm sure they're assigned by people that were never in a lesbian bookstore. Um, one is that we were all very somber and sour-faced and grouchy, which is part of why I loved using that photo of five hysterically laughing uh, lesbians who ran a bookstore of all different colors, and you know, I think in that particular group, my commitment and our commitment was that the staff would look like the community. So we were white, we were black, we were Asian, we were Latina, we were from people born here and from immigrants. Two were immigrants, um, two out of five. So, you know, we did that diversity thing. And one of the, the 
miss is that lesbians hate sex. Now, can I have a show of hands of how many lesbians hate sex? <laughs> but we still have a lot of copies of that. Um, and then you has, oh, the network here. So, um, you know, lesbians like to get together. And a lot of how we socialize, you know, there's, there's certainly bar dikes. If you had a bar in your neighborhood, that was how you could connect with people. But we also did projects. And I think that there's a history of lesbianism and probably of gay men about our projects, which is based on who slept with who, when, and what did they come up with the next day to have another date. So I think that started women's bookstores, it started yogurt collectives, <laughs> 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 and you know, some of the history of those institutions is how long did those relationships hang together? <laughs> and when they broke up, oh, they're with the yogurt collective. <laughs> um, so we did a lot of networking and um, one wonderful thing was in 1976, June Arnold, who was one of the co-founders of Daughters Press, got it in her head, and this was at an event at a uh, woman's place in Oakland, that we should all get together. And then they went out to, uh, what's the name of the bar? Oh, and so on. Which bar are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> From the city. Uh, it was on Solano. It was Wacana. run by... Wacana. No, before Alex. Bacchanal. Yes, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody went to the Bacchanal <laughs> and came up with this plan. And, and so they organized a conference, and it was for lesbian and feminist uh, because we oftentimes have a lot of difficulty with the difference between those two words and was there <laughs> a difference between feminists and lesbians and often it was not very much. So uh, the publishers, the people that ran um, the publications, the distributors, the graphic artists, and the booksellers, and we all descended on the Camp Harriet Harding Campfire Girl Camp outside of Omaha, Nebraska, for a week. And we talked, and we talked. I mean, and we had CIA, CIA FBI people there taking photos of everybody's, you know, I mean, that's important stuff by the time you. <laughs> um, and we had all these ideas, and um, we shared so much information. You know, how do you do this? How do you do that? Oh, we have a lending library. How do you make that work? Um, one of the things, I remember at one point we were talking about books we needed, and there were no books in 1976 about incest. There was one pamphlet published out of Sacramento. It was a quarter, it was a little staple folder pamphlet. And some of us knew about it because we were in California, but the others didn't. So. We sat there, and between us, we could come up with the cost, how many you had to order to get a discount, what the terms were, what the address was, the street number, the zip code. We had all that information in our minds, and we shared it. So, you know, I, I think that's phenomenal in this era of mailing labels and, and forms, but we would have to write out all that stuff every time to order to every publisher to order the books. So we got to the end of the conference and we didn't want to stop talking to each other. And someone came up with this idea that we should start a newsletter. <coughs> and so the publisher started a newsletter. And it didn't last very long. And the printer started a newsletter and they kept it going for a couple of years. But the booksellers, I always felt like we were a little different because, you know, publishers compete with each other for authors. And we felt like we didn't compete with each other, that we all, you know, here's a bookstore here, there's one here, there's one here. And we were competing with each other for sales for the most part. 
And our idea was that the more books we could have to sell, the more sales there would be, the more sales there were, the more books we could buy. And the more books the publishers sold, the more they could publish, then we'd have more books. And it was a very anti-competitive and a very anti-capitalist model. Imagine that. So the end of the week came and we wanted to keep talking to each other and and so we wanted a newsletter. You know, it's like everybody wanted to go to heaven, nobody wanted to die. <laughs> Who's gonna do it? And in the end, I agreed to do it with a woman named Andre who now lives who's now Andre Rivers and lives in Lady Spray. And my challenge is I had tenacity. So I kept it going from 1976, from just before we opened Old Lives Till, until 2000. So it was about a 25 year yeah. And it really was phenomenally effective in terms of when new bookstores opened up, we sent them a bunch of back issues so they could have all the how-to articles. <laughs> we covered basically every lesbian book that was published between like 1976 and 2000, which, you know, stopped that silence. And that meant all the bookstores knew about all the books. Um, we did a lot of connecting. There were about 110 women's bookstores between the US and Canada. And there were another 80 or so which were gay men's bookstores, alternative bookstores that were very much core subscribers. And then, you know, as I said earlier, we went basically to any English speaking bookseller um, who was in feminist books and also the publishers subscribed. And then the mainstream publishers, you know, like I had six copies at one point going into Harper and well, Harper Commons because they wanted to know what was going on. They wanted to know what the next big fad was going to be so they could publish to it. They wanted to know what the feminist presses were doing because whatever the feminist presses were doing, they could then sell, you know, a little bit later. Um, and we also, um, in addition to the women in print conferences, of which there were three, then there were international, um, international feminist book fairs in London and Oslo and Montreal and Amsterdam, um, Barcelona and Australia, London. Um, and one of the things I did out of that was that I collected all of the publishers and bookstores I could find, feminist publishers and lesbian publishers in the global south. And so I published them. And it was this very odd thing that publishers like Kali for Women in India, who also worked very hard at networking, they would read feminist bookstore news to find out where the publish, what there was a new feminist publisher in Pakistan or in um, Malaysia or you know, so it was that kind of networking. And why did the women's bookstore in Kansas have to know that there was something going on in Malaysia? Because it made us so happy. <laughs> I was speaking. I was remembering. Um, the community aspect of everything that we did in the 70s. Um, I met Jim um, uh, at the, what was then called the Eureka Valley branch of the public library. Uh, there was a, a closeted lesbian librarian there named Flo Mitchell. And well, we met, what, every, every two weeks? <laughs> or thereabouts. But um, we were doing, really doing everything all the time. It wasn't like there was a night to do political work and a night to be social or, everybody was doing everything all the time. Um, and um, the Bookstore Network was essential uh, to the literature class at City, more so than at State. I mean, State, uh, San Francisco State and City College of San Francisco had the oldest literature courses 
um, in the world. They both started in 1972. Um, when I began to see the possibilities of a, a whole program. Um, we, we did it a different way at City. We institutionalized it, partially thanks to the work of Ronald Sakaki, um, who uh, was an activist of the time in uh, ethnic studies. <clears throat> and uh, although Berkeley would never approve uh, a queer studies or lesbian and gay studies or an LGBT studies department, uh, they did come down very strongly in favor of uh, what was then called ethnic studies, women's studies, and gay and lesbian studies at City College. Um, and so uh, we had a whole array starting in 1989, and you were talking about open oh, when we first started Halloween. The, um, we started the gay and lesbian studies department on Valentine's Day. <laughs> so the two, the two, San Francisco holidays, basically. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it was a non-competitive model. Everybody simply helped everybody else. And um, I was always, from when I started teaching the class, I kept it um, half uh, gay male, half lesbian. And then as uh, time, and as more, Material came out from African American and Latina uh, Latino writers. I would just make sure everything was represented on uh, the reading list, and I learned a great deal <coughs> from the bookstores by what books were new and who you were helping get published. Um, <clears throat> and I would back before internet and everything, uh, we would uh, Xerox and mimeograph. Does everyone know what mimeograph is? <laughs> <laughs> the, the bookstores would, uh, I would just give them the reading list for the classes. Um, the students would get discounts if they wanted to buy the book. Thanks to the work we did at what was renamed the Harvey Milk Library, and Flo created a, a banner, gay and lesbian collection, and it was the proudest moment of her life. She bought five copies of every city college class because by then we had established an outreach in the evening at the Everett Middle School. So students could go to a gay librarian or lesbian librarian to borrow books for the classes if they didn't want to buy the books. They could go to Old Wives Tales or Walt Whitman Bookstore or several other bookstores and get discounts. Um, and we all helped each other and things just flourished. Um, there, it's not supposed to be that way in the United States, but, but, but it was. <laughs> it really, truly was. Um, once the censorship was lifted, uh, the book world was where it happened, and that meant biographies of famous uh, figures could be open about the, their subject's uh, sexuality. You know, so there were biographers, autobiographies, biographies, novels. Um, sometimes you discovered an interesting history to a book. Like um, I remember a librarian at City College faithfully, like every book we ordered, or every book we used in class, she ordered several copies for the City College collection. And we got to James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room, and she said, isn't it odd? We don't have that. He's a black writer, and we have everything, but that one, I wonder why that is. I said, well, why do you think it is? It's gay. And it had been privately published, Dial Press, in Paris, uh, because it couldn't be published here. You know, it's, uh, so uh, it was a great period of discovery and exploration, and I had the, um, the good fortune to be a book reviewer for a weekly San Francisco gay newspaper called The Sentinel. And I got to review a book every week. Um, and in 78, 77, 78, or thereabouts, every American publisher published a lesbian book or a gay book. Um, and it just suddenly, there was nothing there, and then there was tons there. Um, and. Uh, so we were very much, the bookstores and the classes were very much part of the emerging culture 
you know, I had so many activists in my classes, uh, as well as professional people in counseling, mental health, whatever. Um, I had a psychologist from the VA take my class, and he ended up quitting his clinical job, applying to city as a part-time instructor, and eventually became chair of the psychology department. Um, and we were, because it was San Francisco, and because it was, uh, it was we, it was uh, all of us sexual deviants, uh, there were, people were tremendously overqualified for jobs. So at C City College had more PhDs teaching there than you could shake a stick at. And most of them became activists in whatever field they were in. Um, we decided to go the route of literature, and when we created the department, we kept it in liberal arts, because behavioral sciences, psychology, sociology, and anthropology, uh, anthropology the least, but the other two had been part of our oppression, um, and I was determined not to allow that. So we, be, we were always part of expression, which freed us tremendously. Uh, we were able to start a movie class, for example. And we had classes in relationships and psychology and sociology and so on, but the primary um, focus was always liberal arts. Uh, and um, I think that made our program different because we didn't have to justify whether we were okay. We just looked at expression that you know, people had written, you know, up to, you know, to nearly 3,000 years ago. I mean, Sappho couldn't be psychoanalyzed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But her work was there. It had been censored. And I found out that she, it's still in the Catholic Church. Just by saying her name, I've just excommunicated myself again. <laughs> she was literally anathema. And... Uh, I figured if we stuck with what was already known and what was already out there, we could avoid a lot of the problems that, say, Dr. Ducheco ran into at State. He ran a huge sexuality class, 800 students a semester, out of the psychology department. And lesbian studies sort of came out of women's studies, because Sally Gearhart was the chair of that. And well, it was wonderful. Uh, the literature class was taught by James Brogan, but they, they didn't work with each other so much, and so I don't know what program is still there, but we had it all under one roof, as it were. Um, so uh, a lot of institutions came into being in the 70s that people now don't remember, but there was a, the first gay lesbian physicians group, the first business group, the first lawyers group. There was the Gay Academic Union, um, which was moribund when uh, several of us activists sort of got in there. Uh, we changed the structure from president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, to a steering committee. And within a few months, we went from like 20 people at a meeting to 150. You know, so it's, it's hard to underestimate the enthusiasm and joy we were all feeling. And relatively little op opposition, as I recall. We would kind of push open the door, and nobody would push back. And then we'd say, oh, okay, we'll take over that room now. <laughs> and it really was a remarkable time. But I'd like to reemphasize what Carol was saying. It was not competitive. It had capitalist elements, but our heart just wasn't in it. And, um, Everybody was doing everything all the time, and we strongly believed in liberation. We were socially critical. We'd been shat on for thousands of years, and we weren't taking it anymore. And we actually could imagine a much better world. Um, and some of that is why we're here today. But it, it didn't go as far, I think, as some of us had hoped. Yeah. <laughs> Community center aspects of Jim Trump's. <laughs> Um, you know, as you, so many people in here have, okay, how many people have been in a women's bookstore that's just at some point in their life? <laughs> you know, um, there was this rumor that men weren't welcome and weren't involved. 
and um, you know, which I found very bizarre. We had a, a, and many women's bookstores had a gay men section because we had books that, you know, you, most of which you probably could find at modern times, but not all. Um, and it felt like there was some community going on. And now I will confess that there were another kind of men who came in thinking they were going to find some nice lesbian pornography. <laughs> and some of you may remember a series from the Alice and Bechtel cartoons, but you know, how we would be very assertive with them. And we would say, hello, what are you looking for? Can I help you find something? Is there a book you wanted to see? <laughs> you know, until we could embarrass them out of the bookstore. And at the same time, you know, when we opened um, 532 Valencia Street at the corner of 16th Street, which was just a couple doors down from the Communist Party bookstore, around the corner from the George Jackson Defense Fund. The Roxy Theater reopened almost immediately. Uh, Rainbow Grocery and then Rainbow General Store. And the other exciting, we had two other exciting things in the neighborhood. One was a laundromat right next door to the bookstore. So you could put your clothes in, come hang out in the bookstore, <laughs> move them to the dryer, hang out in the bookstore. And there was also one of the first taquerias, if not the first taqueria, across the street, La Cumbre. And there was a long tradition. People, women, most of it, come on their lunch hour, go at La Cumbre, get a burrito, and come across the street and eat it, wandering around the shelves. One of my favorite <laughs> stories is, at one point, these two women came in kind of <coughs> like, we got a lot of nervous women, but this was different. <laughs> and, you know, eventually they said, well, we were just getting a burrito across the street, and the guy that cashed us out, he said, oh, you're here to go to the bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what bookstore? And he said, oh, this bookstore across the street. I'm sure you'd like it very much. <laughs> and they did like it very much. <laughs> Um, so, there were times when you, when we, I would see a woman <coughs> going by, you know, you watch the street, you watch the door, you want to know who's coming in, you see her again. You know, some people <coughs> went around the block five or six or seven times before they could gather the courage to walk in the bookstore. <laughs> that it was that scary, and it was oftentimes people were confronting their desire for women, for information about women, and stepping across that threshold <laughs> was a big step. And some people went home and tried two or three or four times before they actually got in the door. So one of the things we were was a safe space. One of the things we one of the things we did was the lesbian section. You know, in the middle of the store is the counter. And it's like this file cabinet, you know, four drawer file cabinet. And the lesbian section was beyond the file cabinet, so that you could stand in front of the section and nobody looking in the window <coughs> could see you. You know, we did that kind of safety. Stuff. Um, and of course, we had bulletin boards. <laughs> you know, that's a phrase. You know, now we have email e lists, and before that, there were what they called bulletin boards online. But, you know, that's actually based on this physical thing. It was kind of like a court board. <laughs> you put notices on with thumbtacks. Um, and you found everything there. You found events going on. There weren't any newsletters. Well, there were newspapers, and sometimes the events would get into Plexus, and that was a great thing. But anything with a shorter lead time, it was posted at the bookstore. People who needed roommates were posted at the bookstore. Jobs were posted at the bookstore. It was just a tremendous amount of information. And you know, when anybody was new in town, they came to the bookstore. The, 
study groups, the support groups, the classes. It was all information. It was all there. One thing we did was a tremendous amount of referral and networking. Um, you know, we dealt with everything from when the big three thought about coming out, <coughs> when the big thrilled that they were coming out, to uh, someone needed a tax accountant, someone needed a job, someone needed housing, someone had just come to the city and they were desperate, someone got kicked out of their house, someone was being stalked. Um, you know, those were just the things we did all day, every day. Um, there's another story that I was going to tell. Uh, one thing we did, we ran um, a rental library because not everybody could afford books. And sometimes people wanted a book with a hardcover or what have you. Um, so we had this rental library, and it was, you know, it was a bit of a, how do I say this, a very sincere farce. You know, some woman would come in and you could see her looking at this book, you know, or sometimes people just wanted to take a book in the back and read it, you know, and the, you know, privacy that they could get. And that's fine. People wrote a lot of books there. And sometimes you just knew that somebody needed access to this book. So we would, we were good at meeting people. And we could kind of tell. And we could, um, I would say, well, you know, are you interested in it? Or, well, yeah, but I can't afford it. Oh. Well, let's see if it's in the library. So we'd go into the back room where the library was, and if it wasn't there, I'd pull out the donation spots and say, oh, well, it's not in the library, but there's enough money to buy a copy. Do you want to borrow it? <laughs> and, you know, sometimes they would go home and come back, and sometimes they wouldn't, but you knew that book was being well used. You know, that was the kind of organizing and community work we did. Um, one, one of my favorite community services that we did, well, I'll do another one first. And we had a fair, as always, a fair number of battered women coming in, and we had books. And, you know, those were library books we'd sometimes put in the library because they had no money. And they would go out into the world, and you hoped they went something. I remember one rather spectacular time when some woman's, I hope soon to be ex-husband, dragged her in and was very confrontational and why had he sold this book to his wife and it had nothing to do with them. And it, you know, he just modeled dangerous, abusive behavior all over the place. And you know, we might sussed out what is the least dangerous thing here, and so we refunded the money and, you know, apologized if that was a mistake, you know, but that many people needed to look at books like this because perhaps somebody at their church was being battered and they needed to have something supportive and kind to say to that person, and of course, men did not want to hear that because they thought all the guys at the church had every right to be battered in their wives. It was terrifying. And there were no laws, there was no protection. Um, so that was one thing we did. And on the other extreme, one of the many services we provided was to the Catholic school girls. Because the juniors and seniors at the local Catholic high school were required to do papers. And so they would come in, you know, at term paper time, maybe April, and want to find a book about women's suffrage or feminism or anything like that. And so we would ask what they were interested in and show them the books. And you know, my one of my favorites was this girl who created a stack of books and said, Will you hold these? My mother will come in and pay for them. <laughs> yeah, what? And then they would go off. And the lesbian section would be totally 
culture and it's real, um, devastated. Um, and so all those books would have disappeared. Well, one or two girls was keeping us busy. The rest of them were talking away the whole lesbian novels and what happened. So the next year, that happened again. So we were at the quickest studies. It took us until the third year. It was like, OK, it's April. The girls are going to be coming in, you know, the little black uniforms and the knee socks. So by that time, there were young adult novels for lesbian young adult novels. So we would order them up, and we'd put them all face front so they'd be really easy to find. <laughs> and the girls would come in, and we would talk sincerely with somebody about Susan B. Anthony. Well, they stuck their books and their everything. And then they would all leave, and about half of them would be gone. <laughs> and I felt like that was some of the best community service that I ever had. <laughs> I knew how hard it was to be 15 years old and what a difference a book could make. Yes. And I wanted all those girls to have whatever book it was that was going to send them for. When we opened the Hormel Gay and Lesbian Center um, at the new main public library in April of 1996, April, um, we had been working ourselves late hours, we were fried, it was like we didn't really know what we were doing, who was going to use it, how were they going to use it. Um, so uh, <coughs> the first week I'm sitting there all marrying the librarian eager to help somebody and this young kid, maybe 13, comes in and starts to use the computer and I approach to help him and he's leaves and then he comes back and then he leaves and he leaves and he comes back several times and finally he uh, summons up the nerve to ask me for assistance. I said, well, what are you looking for? And he said, I'm looking for a book about gays like me. And, I, and uh, all the books in the Hormel Center were reference only. And I said, well, do you want a book you can take home? And he said, yes. So we went to the teen section and I fortunately <coughs> found a copy of the anthology in the blue. And I said, is this what you're looking for? He said, yes. He said, um, now if I check this out, will my parents find out? And I said, no. Uh, the confidential confidentiality of the, the borrowing records. Oh, that's good. He said, because um, it would kill them if they found out I was gay. And um, I said, well, that must be tough, not being able to talk to anybody. And he said, well, I can talk to the lesbian who lives next door. <laughs> Oh, well, that's good. Um, and then he, he takes the book and he, he starts to leave and he comes back and he says, um, are there any social service agencies for kids like me? I was like, wow, that he even knew social service agencies. I said, well, there's, there's Lyric in the Castro. Um, and he said, well, uh, you know, I live out in Full Walnut Creek. Uh, I guess I could take it. Bart to the Castro. Well, I took Bart to come here to the library, so yeah, I guess I could do that. So I wrote down um, the information about Lyric and the information about the Civic Center, and um, this kid was really plucky. And um, so he off he goes with the address of what he needs and the copy of my view, and he comes back one more time and he says, I just want you to know that I'm really really grateful for people like you helping people like me. And so, oh, this is what we've been doing all these months. This is why. But there's a coda to the story, which is a few years later, I'm at the reference desk, and this kid walks up and says, hi, remember me? I didn't. He said, you helped me find a, a book a couple of years ago. Said, oh, yeah, that's right, I do remember. Uh, how did that go? And he said, well, it went really well. I'm now uh, out at my Catholic school. Um, I'm out to my parents. And actually, that's why I'm here, because I'm doing a report to my class on homosexuality, and I need your assistance doing the research. <laughs> so, books do make a difference.
first uh, class I taught in 1980, there were, it was packed, there were like 30 people. Um, and as time went on, the class grew. Um, and, you know, students, before we moved most of our stuff to the Everett Middle School and Mission High School, City College campus was where we met. And these Darwin kids would race over to registration with ad slips and get the lesbian and gay men in line. You have to sign this. Because <laughs> um, there's a gay class right across there, and you can take it, and we need signatures and stuff. Um, <clears throat> so it was very exciting. And there was a, a politician named Tim Wolfrid who had, in the early 80s, he was a member of the board, community college, board of trustees, and he kind of protected us. Uh, so we were able to do it really a lot because he was there. And over these damn ad slips, I, I incurred the permanent hatred of the English department chair. Um, and I said, could you sign some ad slips? And she said, we wouldn't be packing the course, would we? I said, no. But kids are just breaking down the door. And she said, well, I don't know. And I said, well, I hate to have to talk to Dr. Wolford, which I, I only did the once. <laughs> and she immediately started signing ad slips. Um, but who, was, who were using those ad slips? The class, I, my first class was literally half lesbian and half gay male. And a woman, uh, the first night said, you know, thank God this class is here, it's wonderful, but like many of us don't relate to gay, we would like to see lesbian in the title. And I agreed completely, went to the English chair of, of that period, who was a closeted gay man, and I said, we have to change the title. I said, half the class doesn't relate to gay. And he said, oh, we can do that. I said, how long do you think it'll take? He said, oh, a couple of years. <laughs> and it did. Uh, because there was tremendous lesbophobia. The gay men in the class, uh, including myself to an extent, although I had many close friends who were lesbians, assumed that, that their world was included lesbians and um, that they knew all about it. And the, uh, what we used the class for uh, was to find out about each other, because I said, folks, we're the most unlikely two groups to be in a class together. We just are. We're, we're here because of 19th century definitions of sexuality. And lesbians and gay men were put under the rubric of homosexuality. But uh, <laughs> otherwise, we would never see each other, <laughs> really. Our proclivities are more towards hanging out with members of our own gender. Um, so. I encouraged, I, I, I was more friendly uh, with women in the classroom uh, because frankly, I mean, to be honest, I was very threatened by gay men. It took me years to figure that out, but I didn't feel comfortable with the really wild and also constant sexuality going on. Um, and the women students, I, I don't mean to broadly, to bro broadly generalize or too broadly, but the women seemed more serious about how valuable this class was. Um, and when we moved to the Everett Middle School, um, I was pleased but a little offended to find out that a lot of the men were taking the class to meet somebody smart. <laughs> and that there was a lot of cruising going on, which is fine, it's fine, but my, I was more like, this is serious, what we're doing. Not to say sexuality isn't, but like, this is amazing what we're doing here. Um, in term, this is a, a, a very unusual thing. So we tended to use the classes uh, to where lesbians could find out more about the real lives of gay men, and gay men could find out the real lives of lesbians. And we were very lucky. Uh, every People tended to bond uh, in the same way as coming into the bookstore was a tremendous experience for so many people. Uh, for some of these students, well, for all of us, really, it's like there's a gay teacher, and everybody in the room is lesbian or gay, and like it's for college credit, and it's free, <laughs> and the state is paying for it. Can this be, you know? 
So uh, it was my priority that we all discover as much about each other as we possibly could. Um, in addition to, and, and you know, reading the, the novels and short story collections and anthologies helped with that. But there had been no easy way for the two groups to talk to each other really before that, although they were tremendous allies. When it was forbidden to dance uh, with the same sex, same gender partner in San Francisco, many of those early bars, somebody <coughs> would say the cops are coming, the women and the men would all start dancing together, and the cops couldn't bust the place. Um, so there had been a, a lot of closeness <laughs> and allyship, but the class offered a real opportunity to find out what people's lives were really like. And th there was often astonishment on both sides, but people learned. Um, and I think, is that what you were alluding to, that story? It was, it was so important. Um, I had never felt that the classroom was somehow separate from society, and this was just a golden opportunity you know, to put some of my personal beliefs into action in ways that I knew would benefit people tremendously. Um, uh, the, the hard part, and uh, it has to be mentioned because I notice nowadays we don't mention it, <laughs> um, the program flourished as the epidemic got started. And then as the epidemic got worse and worse and worse, <laughs> the classes were full. And I learned another thing about the importance of educational gatherings and opportunities. And I still remember vividly, uh, people couldn't talk about what was happening. We were in such shock and grief, constant grief and terror. Um, and um, a woman that both Carol and I know named Valerie Street was a member of the class, and she came in one night and she read a poem she had written called Gethsemane, where she wrote about what was happening to us all, and Valerie's a strong, I mean, there's nothing wrong with crying, but you would, you would not ordinarily expect Valerie to cry, and she read her poem and she just started sobbing, and then that opened the door to everyone being able to talk about whether, if, if they felt like it, you know, were they HIV positive, <coughs> had they lost friends and lovers to AIDS, and so on, and it, it struck me that the classes were packed at a time of darkness and fear. Um, and then add Reagan to the um, equation. The classes were packed, and that said something to me about uh, how extremely positive people gathering, how extremely positive that is. In fact, the only time I ever thought of leaving teaching was over Reagan's election. Um, uh, the, the students were really upset, and I could feel it. I said, okay, we have to talk about it. And everybody was terrified. I mean, in the way many are terrified of Trump. Um, but it hadn't happened yet. It hadn't happened before. Reagan was the first one. And everybody was really scared, and they needed to talk about it. And we had a very good talk. But I remember a, a man who's uh, who wrote for the BAR and was more conservative than the others. He said, well, I'm not worried. I said, you're not worried what? He said, well, our names are on the class list and all, but you're the intellectual. They're going to go after you. Oh, wow. And I went, how, like, hello? <laughs> I said, your name is on the list, and if they go after me, they'll go after all of us. But he said, no, they'll go after you. You're the intellectual. And it really <coughs> upset me. Um, but I went back the following week and kind of got over it. Uh, but So I guess what I'm trying to demonstrate is the importance of solidarity and then how destructive it is not to.